Welcome to Women Positively Aging, the podcast for women in midlife who want to live well for longer. I'm your host, Barbara Bray. I'm a PhD researcher in healthy aging diets at Queen's University Belfast in Northern Ireland, part of the UK. I'm passionate about living well for long days, woven into my research. And the reason I set up this podcast was to help people who are in midlife realize that there are things that we can do to improve the quality of our health as we age. Some of it is to do with genetics, some of it's to do with the environment, but there's some good news there about our lifestyle choices and behaviors, things that we can do just to inch closer to having a healthier lifestyle once you take away some of the wider environmental and genetic factors. Season two of this podcast builds on season one, where we'll be looking at specific areas such as bone health and weight management, things that have been bothering women probably didn't want to talk about them or didn't know the right source of information to look for. I invite experts, but also people with lived experience to share their experiences and tell their stories that you can learn from them as well. I do look forward to getting new listeners to the podcast and engaging with you either on social media or sending me messages on my website. And please do subscribe to the podcast so you get to find out when new episodes are released. Thank you very much and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to this episode of Women Positively Aging, where we'll be talking about depression and anxiety. Depression is one of the leading causes of disease-related disability in women, and they are nearly twice as likely as men to suffer from an episode of depression. The prevalence has been reported to be high, particularly during the menopause transition. Women with a history of depression and anxiety report worse quality of life during their mid-years, something which I'm going to be talking to today's guest about. She is Dr. Charlotte Marriott, a consultant NHS psychiatrist, a certified lifestyle medicine physician, and a nature-based coach. She likes to inspire and empower people to make small changes to their lifestyles to improve their physical and mental health and well-being. And she is the ideal expert for today's topic on depression and anxiety. Welcome, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Barbara. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. I've been following you on Instagram for a while, so it's great to have you here to be able to tell us more. And if you could start off really with the difference between anxiety and depression. Yeah, certainly. And it's an interesting one because the two often go hand in hand. You know, often when people are depressed, they also feel really anxious. Mm -hmm. And anxiety, especially chronic anxiety, can make people quite depressed as well. Um, So we'll kind of break those things down a bit. And I I suppose anxiety we can think of because we can all imagine what it's like to feel anxious. We've all experienced those symptoms of anxiety at different times in our life, you know, going through stressful circumstances or if you've got an exam or a big event or something like that. And you'll notice the physical symptoms of anxiety. So you might notice your heart pounding, feeling short of breath, butterflies in your stomach, tingling in your fingers, those kinds of things. But there are also psychological symptoms of anxiety could be worry, could be anticipating the worst outcome possible, um, etc. And also behavioral symptoms as well. And that could be things like avoidance, um, or, you know, not not going for the job interview that Mm. that you you really want the job for, um, and, and so on. And I think the other thing to mention is that anxiety is not one thing. Um, There are a range of different anxiety disorders. Mm. The most common one that I suppose we all think of would be generalized anxiety disorder, which is when kind of free floating anxiety, we we call it, where you feel a bit anxious a lot of the time and Mm -hmm. it's not dependent on what setting you're in, um, although it's less likely to be experience when you're at home in your comfortable surroundings um, but you get all those sort of physical and psychological symptoms that we were talking mm-hmm. about but then there are other disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder obsessive compulsive disorder specific mm-hmm. phobias including social phobia um, and also panic disorder as well so okay. anxiety is not one thing um, and it can be really important to kind of break that down with your doctor and make sense of what's going on for you if you are experiencing anxiety um, mm-hmm. and sometimes people can experience anxiety symptoms that are predominantly physical and they don't have so much of the psychological symptoms. Um, People might get, for example, IBS symptoms, um, pain from fibromyalgia and things like that that can be really Mm -hmm. exacerbated by anxiety. Um, So that's something else to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And then depression is 
is is different. I said they can often go hand in hand, and that's true. But depression is is mostly characterized by low mood, pervasive low mood for at least two weeks, um, mm. and accompanying that you get loss of motivation you get loss of energy you don't enjoy things you normally enjoy everything seems a bit flat and kind of meh and you just don't have any mm. get up and go so those are the really common symptoms of depression but also with depression get biological symptoms including um, impact on your sleep commonly mm. really poor sleep um, difficulty falling asleep also waking really early in the morning or conversely, some people just want to sleep all the time. Um, changes in appetite, you might lose your appetite or you just might want to eat more than usual, sort of comfort eating. Um, and people might really struggle. So depression is on a, on a spectrum from mild, moderate to severe. And in severe stages of, of depression, people might really struggle to do basic things like get out of bed and get washed or clean their teeth um, and certainly really struggle to manage day-to-day -day activities so um, mm -hmm. it can really impact quality of life and at the very severe end of depression it can cause psychotic symptoms where people start to have delusions um, and and yeah it, it encompasses the whole range. Oh, thanks for that clarity and it's, it's clarity in one sense, but also it, re it makes me realise that there's a whole lot of symptoms in there that can be shared with lots of other things as well. So it's not surprising that people necessarily don't know where they're at with one, the other, or any other health issues that they have, because there's a lot going on in there. Yeah, absolutely. And we know as well that people with, for example, chronic medical conditions mm. um, are more likely to experience depression. And depression also increases your risk of developing other chronic medical conditions. So mm -hmm. it's it's very, very inter interrelated and complex, absolutely. Gosh, that's some food for thought there. And what I'd like to do now really is, is unpack what I started talking about at the very beginning, about the risks that women have and the prevalence of depression and, and anxiety in midlife particularly. So what are some of the pathways and what are some of the risks around that? Mm. Yes, and as you said at the beginning, women from puberty to postmenopause are nearly twice as likely to suffer from depression and anxiety than men. We don't mm. know exactly why, but I think it's probably oh, okay. hugely complex. I think mm. hormones play a role, and particularly, like you were saying, in the perimenopause, um, we know that there's an increase in depression or feelings of of depression around around menopause. Um, there's also you know, how much we have to juggle as women in modern society. We are the main home runners, the main child carers. We're also having professional careers and mm -hmm. juggling all of that complexity can be very hard. Um, there's also this term that a colleague used recently of the sandwich years where yes. we're in the middle of the older generation and the younger generation and kind of looking after everyone yes. <laughs> so there's a lot of burden on us it can be very stressful um, and often we don't feel well enough supported by mm -hmm. society I think because of the structure of it all um, and yeah so I think those are some of the main risk factors for depression in women mm -hmm. And that sounds fairly reasonable. I think I could do a whole episode on the sandwich generation, actually, because uh, isn't it Generation X in, in general, isn't it? Because Generation X are that age group where you're more likely to have ageing parents and children going through GCSEs, A-levels, <laughs> degree exams. So, yeah, there's yeah. never a quiet moment in your life at all, is there? No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I can relate to that on a pers personal level, absolutely. Yes, I'm sure everyone listening can as well. <laughs> In fact, yesterday, I'll just tell you this funny story. I was sitting next to a lady on the plane and I didn't know how we got talking about it, but she started to tell me how her mother-in-law has Alzheimer's dementia and they have a little app that they use with a tracker. So they just sew this tracker into the bottom of her handbag so that when she's wandering out of the house, they can they give her sort of five minutes to get it out of her, out of her system and then they go looking for her. And I was, I was making a note of that thinking, oh, that's really helpful because this the kind of things you really you might I don't need to know that yet but yes I probably will do at some point and it's funny how your conversations with strangers of a certain age are all about how you manage people in your life and 
have solutions for lots of different problems. Whereas 10, 20 years ago, it would have been about what you're doing at the weekend, where you're going out for dinner. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's a whole so different true. group of conversations. It's really true. Absolutely. And I'm always talking to my husband about the mental load, because <laughs> I think women, somehow we kind of take responsibility for that. And we shoulder a lot of the burden of we need to do this, this and this, this needs organizing, that needs organizing. I need to do this for work. The kids need this for school. I've got to arrange this birthday present for that family member. And we yeah. take on a lot of this responsibility and the first time I mentioned the mental load to my husband he said that doesn't exist <laughs> <laughs> so I've been educating him ever since <laughs> oh that's too funny <laughs> yeah I'm not going to start to doing the gender stereotypes but obviously this is a show for women so we'll bring it back to women <laughs> yeah you know, it's not a problem for men <laughs> So we were talking, uh, and I interrupted you when you were talking about the risk, but I really wanted to go through and, and look at some of the pathways. And we've we've talked about being Generation X, being that sandwich generation. Mm. But I guess as women, is there anything we can do about finding out the tipping point? So when we've gone from that generalised anxiety into something else, how do we manage that? Mm. That's a really interesting question. I think I think part of it is just being really aware of of the risk of it and how important it is to take care of ourselves in ways that can reduce the risk. Because, you know, there's that, that huge cliche, isn't there, about um, when the oxygen mask comes down on the airplane, you put your own mask on first because otherwise you pass out and you can't look yes. after everybody else. And it's, it's hugely cliched, but it's actually really, really true. If we don't look after ourselves and if we're not in optimal health and feeling good and energetic, you know, we can't look after all the people that we need to look after and do all the things we need to do. So I think that's really key. And being aware of the things that make you feel good and the things that make you feel less good and, you know, doing more of the things that make you feel good is really important. Um, I think thinking about risk factors, one of the things that I didn't mention is that as we age, and as we approach the menopause and go through the, the menopause transition, um, inflammation in, in our bodies is really, really key to, mm. to part of, of the changes that occur to us physically and, and mentally and emotionally during that time. So, you know, doing things that are not pro-inflammatory is really important. And um, there are all sorts of things that have an impact on inflammation in our body, including nutrition and physical mm. activity and sleep and avoiding avoiding things like ultra processed foods and alcohol and smoking and, and all of those sorts of things can mm. can have a really important impact on our health and well-being. And that's interesting because all throughout the, the series, I've been looking at different aspects of, of our lives as women. And last the last one was letting go of wanting to lose weight. And we were talking about how women over time can have spent most of their lives on a diet. And what they don't realise is how damaging that is to the body because you've been denying it of too many calories in a lot of cases, but also some important nutrients. And you get to a stage in midlife where you're not as robust as you should be because you've been on a diet for most of your life and you carry on on that diet for the rest of your life. And it, it has a really negative impact. And it's the same, I guess, with physical activity. If you continue reducing your physical activity, and I can't run as fast as I could when I was 20 that's a given it's not going to happen but I think reducing the amount of physical activity isn't helpful but because we're busy we start to chip away at the things that are keeping us on an even keel so the exercise the good quality of food in our diet and things like that and you start to skip out on meeting up with friends because it's just easier to stay home and it, I guess there's not one point where you stop being good to yourself it must be a bit of a, a sliding scale or a dare I say, a slippery slope? Yeah, I think that's really true. And I think we've been sold so many lies, haven't we, by the media about women and our bodies and what we should look like and what we need to eat and what we shouldn't eat and, you know, what this celebrity says and what's their workout routine. And all of these things yes. are so damaging for our body image, but also for our healthy habits. And um, I think I agree with you completely about, you know, restriction, cutting out food groups and all of these things are hugely damaging um and yeah physical activity we may need to adjust what we do as we get older but absolutely staying active is key um and for example you know from the age of 30 we're losing lean muscle mass rapidly but lean yes. muscle mass is vitally important as a metabolic organ in the body it's protective against cognitive decline as we age um so maintaining muscle mass through regular activity is really important um and being physically active, 
you know, it makes you feel good in the short term because you're releasing all those happy hormones, but it has a much more important impact on brain health and cognitive um, ability as we age because whenever we exercise, we're releasing brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, which is like fertilizer for the brain. It helps mm -hmm. us make new brain cells, new brain cell connections, and improves blood flow to the brain. Um, and it's been shown that it can increase uh, the volume of our hippocampus, the hippocampus being the the part of the brain that's most involved with learning memory and also regulating emotion. Um, and so regular physical activity can reduce the risk of depression, anxiety, um, cognitive decline, and it's been shown to reduce the risk of things like Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's disease. Um, but also if somebody is already suffering from depression or anxiety, it's been shown to reduce symptoms, improve quality of life. And even in schizophrenia, it can reduce the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, which are things like apathy um, and loss of energy and stuff and improve quality of life and well-being. So, you know, across the board, physical activity is beneficial for our body, brain and mind. Absolutely. That's fascinating. I hadn't realised even with people who clinically have been diagnosed with a whole range of issues that that would be helpful as well because you'd think well if somebody can't physically get out of bed then saying to them oh a bit more physical activity I kind of thought well that that's never going to work and is that practical can that really be shown to be effective or, or is it you know is it practical to be able to get people to do that? Yeah, it, it really depends. So the research that's been done on depression has been a mild to moderate side okay. of the scale. So when people mm -hmm. are still able to get up and do things, but, you know, they've got the depressive symptoms. Um, mm. And I think things need to be tailored to what the person is able to do. Um, okay. So if, if someone's, you know, so depressed that they can't get out of bed, then expecting them to go for a walk is, is not viable at all. Mm -hmm. But lots of research has been done um, that shows that exercise that is group based, that is moderate in intensity and is led by a supervisor is effective for treating symptoms of depression. And in fact, some studies have shown that it's as effective as an antidepressant and talking therapies combined. So wow. it's um, now in the NICE guidance as well, the nice new mm -hmm. NICE guidelines for depression. Group physical activity is one of the interventions for mild to moderate depression. So yeah, the evidence base is there and it's going to improve your cardiovascular health, your metabolic health, reducing risk of type 2 diabetes. Physical activity also reduces risk of various types of cancer, including breast cancer and colon cancer, by as much as 20% reduced risk of wow. cancer. Um, yeah, so across the board, necessary. Also, as we age, we need to think about our bone density, our bone mm -hmm. health. Um, and, you know, as we get older, we don't want to be frail and at risk of falling. And if we do fall, we don't want to be breaking our hip, you know. So hugely important to work on things like strength, balance, um, proprioception and all of those things as well. Oh, that's a great boost to, to learn that. Big fan of physical activity myself. So I, my thing is swimming. So I'm going to keep on doing that for as long as I possibly can. As long as our lakes and rivers and seas are clean in the UK. Or yes. If I have to go abroad, so be it. <laughs> no, absolutely. That's another passion of mine. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. Our rivers and seas need to be clean. And uh, I support some charities that, that do work in that. Because I think we all need to be able to access the outdoors safely and benefit from all that being in nature has to offer. Um, so yeah, that's really important as well and one thing I just quickly wanted to mention about a recent study I saw about physical activity while we're still on the topic is that just 11 minutes of walking a day can be protective for our health so you know really small amount of exercise is beneficial so just wanted to get that out there as well that's brilliant. I'm currently doing a trial on um, bite-sized physical activity to see if we can motivate people to do a minimum of 30 minutes a day, but in bite-sized 10-minute pieces. So I'll be interested to see what our results show on that. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> well, awesome if it works. We'll see. We'll see. I'm very confident. <laughs> Well, there was one other risk factor that you've mentioned that I did want to touch on because you mentioned alcohol. I know with my generation, people who are definitely and firmly in Generation X, people naturally seem to be drinking a little bit less. But we have 
from a public health point of view, and I, I get that public health messages have to be global and general. You can't sort of say, well, this particular group of people do X and Y. But for women in midlife, what do you recommend, particularly for people who think they might have issues around anxiety and, and depression? So what's the, the guidance really on alcohol consumption? Mm, yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? So I think the the guidelines are 14 units a week maximum mm. for women. Um <laughs> But there's also the statement that the safe limit of alcohol is no alcohol. So, yeah. you know, but then we've also got to balance social, social life and spending time with friends and, you know, all of those things. Alcohol is part of day to day life, isn't it? Especially in celebrations and stuff like that. And there can be some benefits to a small amount of alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. For example, red wine has been cited yes. as being cardioprotective, um, although the beneficial effects of it are probably due to the polyphenols in it, which you can get Great in a wide range. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> fruit and vegetables. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody to start drinking red wine to protect their health. But if you enjoy a glass of red wine occasionally, I think that's absolutely fine. But we do know that alcohol can really affect sleep um, mm -hmm. and it can affect your cognitive function. And it's, you know, detrimental to our health in so many other ways, particularly if we're drinking excessively or if we're using it as self-medication. You know, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. we're feeling anxious or low and we're, we're drinking to make us feel better, that's going to have a really uh, negative effect on us, particularly if it stops us seeking more effective sources of help and support and treatment as well. And is that something that you see? So do you feel that people who have got issues with anxiety and depression are more likely to self-medicate through alcohol or...? I, I don't know if I see it that way around so much as in oh. the other way around. So I think generally people who drink too much um, usually have issues with depression and anxiety, if you I see, see what I mean. Yes, yeah. I do see that. Yeah, That's interesting. Hmm. But good for me personally, because I don't drink, so it's not a problem <laughs> <laughs> for now. Yeah. <laughs> but I did want to touch on what people can do. So we talked about the preventative things that we can do. So, for example, looking at diet, looking at physical activity and managing our alcohol intake but in terms of if you're already in that space where you have got those symptoms of anxiety and depression you talked about seeking help and based in the UK obviously we've got the NHS but I've seen in the news as well there are a lot of unregulated professions out there purporting to help people so I guess as an NHS doctor what I'm asking you is, is your professional opinion on the initial steps that you should be taking if you think the anxiety or depression is unmanageable? Yeah, absolutely. I think my first recommendation would be see your GP as your first mm -hmm. port of call. GPs manage the vast majority of mild to moderate mental illness. If it's more severe or difficult to treat, then GP might refer to mental health services and you'll see someone like me in secondary care. Um, and then in secondary care, you know, we have access to the, the psychologists and a wide range of psychosocial interventions. Um, but services are much more fluid now than they used to be. So the divide between primary care and secondary care is is kind of reduced um, so it's easier to access talking therapies via primary care you can see mm -hmm. mental health professionals in your GP practice now so things things have got better in the UK in that regard although we have got so many problems with regards to staffing and resource and you know underfunding and all of that um, but GP first port of call and then I would suggest that if you are looking for a psychologist privately um, or a psychological therapy privately, going through the uh, British Psychological Association and okay. checking, the, you know, that people have got the, the required qualifications, that they're a member of the regulatory body um, and that they're approved and, and all of that. Because, they're, like you said, there there are a lot of people who purport to help but may not be regulated and, and may cause more harm than good. Um, I would also say that if if you do go privately, then you would, you know, it's, it's, uh, it can be a case of too many cooks spoiling the broth. You don't want to be seeing NHS professionals and private professionals who may have different approaches or be doing things oh, differently okay. and can cause more harm than good as well. So, yeah. um Yes, that's that's another thing. And then in a more urgent situation, for example, if there are thoughts of self-harm or suicide, um, you might need more urgent help and support. And that can be accessed through um, your local 
A&E department or crisis mm-hmm. service if you know depending on what area you work in there are different ways of accessing those um, or then there are all the third sector organizations as well Samaritans, Sane Line, um, Shout, um, Mind as well mm-hmm. are lots of charitable organizations that are there 24 hours a day as well. That's really good. I'll put some links to all of those services in the show notes as well. And one thing I did want to just get a bit more clarity on was around depression, anxiety and menopause, because I know that there's some symptoms that are temporarily experienced in menopause that aren't necessarily anxiety and depression. So how do you kind of work your way through what you're experiencing and at what point, I guess, is it good to go and seek help? Mm, yeah, that's the tricky one. Because I think depression can present a bit differently in the menopause and mm. there's less of the sadness perhaps and more of the lack of energy and motivation, um, brain fog and those kind of symptoms. Mm. Um, but we do know that depression and menopause can be confounded. They can be one and the same thing, but they can also okay. be separate things. Um, I'm not a menopause specialist, so I would advise seeking um, advice from a GP with a special interest in menopause. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then, you know, if necessary, being referred on to a psychiatrist or or being treated for depression if, if it's thought that there is a, a depressive episode there. Yeah. But it is complicated, isn't it? Because a lot of these symptoms are layered so you can get them with lots of different causes and it's kind of as a lay person you don't know what's going on and that makes it difficult to explain to a health professional who can then diagnose you accurately because you know from one day to the next you might be experiencing a little bit of each Um, and you hear stories of people presenting with menopausal symptoms but being treated for depression when actually it was the other way around and I can understand how that happens because if you aren't able to communicate what you're experiencing very well I can totally see how the diagnosis isn't right. Yes absolutely I think partly the communication but also partly um, I think menopause is still not that well understood by the majority of healthcare yes. professionals you know people the conversation has only been really opened up in recent years and it's mm-hmm. becoming more talked about and more understood but I think you're right previously a lot of women went to the GP saying I just don't feel good I've got no energy I can't do this and I can't think straight and and they were diagnosed with depression and started on SSRIs which were not helpful mm-hmm. and often had side effects that were worse than the symptoms that they presented with in the first place Mm -hmm. um so i think yes i think for women of menopausal perimenopausal age getting an accurate understanding of what is going on whether it's menopause or depression is really important and and also with you know perimenopause blood tests aren't helpful so you can check Mm -hmm. hormone levels but normal Mm -hmm. hormone levels don't necessarily mean that you're not suffering perimenopausal symptoms so yes. it's really difficult to tease it all out um, but I think you're right I think the the kind of narrative that you give of you know onset of these symptoms what you've noticed how they've changed over time I think is really really important yeah yeah thank you for that so Charlotte we have covered a huge amount of information today what I'd like to do is finish with your top three take-homes for how we can optimize our health and well-being please Certainly. Okay. So my number one would be optimizing your nutrition, reducing ultra processed and processed foods and and following as much as possible a a Mediterranean style diet. So a lot of whole foods, fruit, veg, nuts, seeds, whole grains, pulses, uh, fatty fish, if that's in your diet, um, extra virgin olive oil neuroprotective, super good for our cardiovascular health, our mental health. um, And omega-3 supplements, which could be vegan or fish oil based, depending on on your dietary preferences. So that would be number one. Um, Number two would be maintaining physical activity, which a key thing is doing something you enjoy that you want to do that makes you feel good and you know take away the whole notion of no pain no gain but (laughs) move a little bit every day in a way that makes you feel good maintain your strength and your muscle mass as you age to protect your bones your heart your brain your mind and reduce the risk of falls and fractures and things like that as we get older Um, and then the third thing would be well, what should I pick as my third thing? I think it could be just 
getting outside a bit every day into nature. We haven't talked about nature yet, but being out in nature can be absolutely fundamental for managing stress, improving how we feel about ourselves and the world around us, and helping us keep doing all the things we need to to do every day. So combining physical activity and nature, I think, would be would be a, a top tip as well. That's some great advice. And being a big fan of swimming, that's something I could say. I could tick that box. Hurrah! <laughs> I'm already doing the things that I need to do. And I hope the people in the audience who are listening have already got something on their list of to-dos that's going to help them get outside a bit more. And obviously, at certain times of the year, that's easier to do than others. But I wish everybody the best of luck with, with trying to find something that fits with their time frame and their ability. And cooking from scratch, I don't know if we're all going to meet that, but please do not feel overwhelmed by the Mediterranean diet there are easier ways of making it fit with what you do in your life yeah thank you for that and thank you very much charlotte for all your really helpful advice and i'll put the links in the show notes to all the different organizations that you mentioned and all the tips that will be really useful for people thank you very much thank you so much lovely to meet you thank you for listening to this episode of women positively aging If you like what you've heard, please do click subscribe and you'll be notified of when the next episode lands on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and all the usual podcast players. Don't hesitate to contact me if you're also interested in hearing more about my healthy ageing diet research. I'd love to work with businesses who are developing food products and looking at how they can improve them and target them towards people's needs as they age, but also organizations that want to help their employees who are in midlife improve the quality of their diets and inevitably how they will age and live well for longer. Thank you for listening and I look forward to having you on again when I have the next episode. Take care and stay well. Monkey Pants Productions Podcast.